Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hyperspace on the Dark Matter Digital Network. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven. I want to thank everybody for tuning in this evening, and a special thank you to webmaster and producer Keith Rowland. And this week, of course, uh, well, actually today or tonight will be my last show live for Hyperspace here at the Dark Matter Digital Network due to Art's departure from the station. So I want to thank all of you for tuning into my show, and I hope you have received some knowledge from my guests over, over the years. It's been a pleasure to broadcast here at the Dark Matter Digital Network and has been a great run. And of course, Hyperspace will be resurrected live on PSN Radio starting in January 2016, Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we'll see if we can't work out a way to maybe pre send some pre-recorded archives over to, to Keith. Uh, we'll see what, what the plan is on that one. Anyone wishing to follow Hyperspace can do so and tune in live, as I said, and listen to the show at PSN Radio in January of 2016, starting the new year. Uh, I also host a live radio show called Raven Stars Witching Hour each Saturday night at 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time on freedomslips.com. So feel free to tune in and follow my work there and shows. You can also follow my work, books, documentaries, and lectures on my website, Night Shadow Anomaly Detectives. And in the meantime, I want to thank you, Keith Rowland. You have been awesome, who has been an outstanding producer and webmaster and best, best wishes to Art Bell and his family. And my special guest this evening is Jason Gerald and Ross Hamilton. I've got two wonderful guys on tonight. And let me get you their bios here. Ross Hamilton, born in 1948 in New York, University of Cincinnati, alumnus. Ross Hamilton is a writer and researcher currently specializing in piercing, or excuse me, piecing together ancient North American prehistory with a view toward understanding the hidden heritage of the American continent for its future spiritual advancement. Ross's book, The Mystery of the Serpent Mound, represents a 12-year research effort to correlate the main body of the teachings of the ancient mystery colleges to the shape and design of the famous earthwork. He also authored a tradition of giants about the race of mound-building giants of North America and Star Mounds, Legacy of a Native American Mystery. Ross has appeared on several television shows, including Ancient Aliens, America Unearthed, with uh, Scott Walter, and In Search of Ancient Giants with Jim and Bill Vieira. And let me get you. Uh, I'm looking here. Okay, Jason Gerald's bio has been studying prehistoric civilizations and the Nephilim for 17 years. During the last six years, he and his wife Sarah have been involved in an independent investigation of the Adena culture of North American mound builders. Over the course of their research, they have studied over 100 years of literature, including archaeological reports from North America, Europe, and the ancient East, as well as the writings of 19th century antiquarians. Their work also involves investigations of lost or forgotten archaeological sites in Ohio, Kentucky, and the Kanawha Valley of West Virginia. Their conclusions are that gigantic skeletons connected with a colonizing Indo-European culture were discovered well over 100 years ago in the United States and subsequently concealed by a powerful transnational force. Sarah and Jason have published articles with the Ancient Origins website and Ancient American Magazine, AlleghenyMounds.com. And please welcome these gentlemen to the show this evening on my final show there. Hey there, hey. Ross, Jason. Hello. Hi. Hi, Ross. Hey. It's wonderful to have you both on. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm looking forward to having this great conversation here. So so where do we start? Now, I'm going to let you guys kind of have the floor as far as what you want to talk about tonight and what, what you feel is pertinent to address. Um, let's start with Ross for a little bit here. Ross, um, obviously, you, you're um, connected with the Mystery of the Serpent Mound, and, and uh, you've done so much research, and uh, I guess you're kind of like the uh, the originator of all this data. You, you were called the grandfather of giantology. Is that right? Isn't that funny? <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't know that myself until somebody drew my attention to it. I think it was uh, Jim and Bill Vieira on their TV show, and they said, hmm, you mean nobody has given any context? No, nobody had. So I, um, I have that, uh, that title, although I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it in a job interview. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I understand that one. So tell us what, you, what you've been working on as of recent. What have you been doing? Well, um, <clears throat> I, 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 you know, a show like this, we have a couple of hours. Uh, we did sort of want to go back and forth. I want Jason to have as much okay. time as he needs uh, to comment. Um, uh, Jason and I don't agree on everything, but we do agree on the fundamentals of, um, of the very tall people. Um, this whole adventure started, I guess, about six or seven years after I first published The Mystery of the Serpent Man. And I had teamed up with a, uh, a woman who lives up uh, near Columbus, Ohio. I live in Cincinnati. And uh, she had read my book, and she wanted to, uh, to get a research project going on the mounds and earthworks because uh, she had uh, online access. Now, back in 1998, 1999, uh, there weren't a lot of people using the Internet to, to research. 
But her husband was a programmer for uh, the U.S. military, and so he was able to show her a lot of shortcuts and secrets. And because of that, we really got into a lot of libraries and museums and townships, uh, <clears throat> libraries, and so forth, all over the uh, state of Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky. And this uh, kind of backed up a background that we both had in growing up in Ohio, where we've always been aware of these earthen mounds. And uh, the, only, the only caveat was that we weren't really that aware of the real origin of them because uh, archaeology and anthropology has been following uh, the status quo which is uh, very much uh, excluding of Native American people, of Indian people. And so the, the history of the mounds and the history of uh, Indian people in general, which we know was taken from them uh, when we uh, supposedly conquered them, uh, has, been, um, has been our legacy uh, uh, through, the, uh, through the interpretations of white men. So um, we very quickly found ourselves potentially uh, into uh, an embroiling uh, situation, being at odds with archaeologists and anthropologists. So we settled uh, on our website at, at kind of walking that fine line of, uh, of interpretation uh, by um, giving credit where credit was due and just sticking to the facts and so forth. But Great. then we made the acquaintance of Vine Deloria Jr. And I don't know how many people out there are familiar with Vine's writings, but he's a college professor. Um, he died in, in, I think, 2005. But he was a college professor uh, specializing in law and, uh, and other, other areas, you know, Indian history and so forth. But he was a standing rock Sioux by birth. He was well integrated into the system. He and his father were both ordained Episcopal ministers. But Vine was very much the activist for Native rights. And as I got to know him more and more, I realized uh, that between talking to him, writing back and forth, and reading his books, that he was really into a lot of the kind of things that... Uh, that our scene is into um, the uh, the real prehistory of the world and uh, the anomalies that have been ignored and not discussed by archaeology, and so um, we began to um, write our articles from the Native American point of view, and what we found just astonished us. You want to comment, Jason? Well, certainly. First of all, I would just like to say that sharing a radio show with Ross Hamilton, for me personally, is a dream come true, because your research and the work that you did with Vine proved that the mythic and the legendary can be found in the archaeological record. And what this means for us today as a people, as many peoples, and for our civilization is vitally, it's vitally important because according to the mainstream sources, there have never been anomalous humanoids found by archaeologists. Mm -hmm. But going back to the earliest settlers, just after the Revolutionary War, they recorded almost immediately unearthing the bones of gigantic humanoids as they began to develop the land. And these gigantic skeletons were found in burial mounds and subsurface graves of the prehistoric era. So rediscovering the tall ones was a vital part of reconstructing a greater prehistoric reality which has been stolen from us. Mm -hmm. Well said, indeed. And yeah. also, um, Ross, didn't you believe that the Serpent Mound needed to be redated to be built um, at an earlier time? Or Yeah, the, uh, the dates of the Serpent Mound have always been uh, disputed. 
Mm-hmm. Um, for a long time, it was thought, um, and rightly, uh, from the uh, late 1800s when they didn't have carbon dating, that the one large mound on the site, of course, the serpent itself had no burials, the one large mound on the site yielded what we call a Dina artifacts. A Dina is a name of a people that uh, dwell in the Ohio Valley uh, between, oh, roughly, uh, let's say a thousand years before the common era, thousand BC or BCE to about zero. So they, they you know, the beginning of the common era where they were, uh, where they gave, uh, the reins of control over to what we call the Hopewell people, which is another name that we sort of made up for these people. Um, that mound, that serpent mound being a Dina, uh, naturally, um, Professor Putnam from Harvard, who did all the excavations just after the Civil War there, uh, uh, believed that the uh, the serpent was also um, these people. He didn't know Adina at that time. That was that came later. So he thought that uh, whoever was buried in, in the earthwork, and they did find a skeleton that was cut off at the knees, and the guy was still seven feet in length. And uh, in his writings, he was very careful not to uh, not to discuss uh, any extraordinary stature. And so he named he did say that the individual was six feet in length, uh, but he didn't say that the uh, that he'd been cut off of the knees. We found a postcard of that individual, and uh, sure enough, it. Uh, it's one of the only photographic proofs we have of an individual that probably stood seven feet or more in, in height. So there's some confusion about the length of that skeleton, but um, we do have the records uh, from other areas surrounding the Serpent Mound in virtually every county of Ohio and Indiana, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, which is where Jason and his wife live, and, and Pennsylvania, and even on up into Michigan, that uh, proves that uh, there were, uh, at least anecdotally, uh, people that stood basically seven feet in height and up. There was a lot of six-footers discovered among the Adena people, but the Hopewell people, who I said took over, had no very tall members. Uh, the the average Hopewell skeleton was for a man five seven or eight, mm. and for the women it's the same as the average Adina, which is five foot one or two. Mm. So the general population of the Adina were the same approximately as the general Hopewell population, but among the Adina there were these outstanding individuals who often enough. Uh, played the roles of chieftains, uh, medicine people, and warriors, you know, war chiefs and so forth. Uh, So there was apparently a hierarchically arranged uh, system uh, to the Adena people that disappeared after the Adena left Ohio in Ohio, but started showing up on the East Coast and the uh, states in New England. Uh, uh, in post Adena times from Ohio. And so uh, we have records from the early English that talk about the Susquehanna uh, men and women that often stood over seven feet and as much as eight feet in height. Uh, just, just strapping uh, men and women. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were uh, extraordinary. Uh, also, is believed in their intellectual power and their, with their ability to rule and get their messages across. The same thing happened out, out west in the Ozarks because the Yadina people also moved to the west and to the south when they left Ohio. So we have a lot of accounts of, of very tall men and women who kind of ran the show wherever they went. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we have uh, the, the Ozarkian uh, version of the Suan people who uh, who 
confine themselves to to one tribe, just like uh, one tribe uh, contained all the giants up in New England before they were dispersed. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, these people um, controlled the economies of uh, of New England and uh, and the Sioux territories before they were also disbanded. But we have accounts of them that they wanted to be taxed by the uh, early American government, and they didn't like it. They didn't. They didn't allow themselves to be taxed. But they were the uh, the the bane of all of the other Siouan speaking people. They uh, pretty much taxed the people themselves <laughs> oh, wow. by their by their controlling the economies. Mm-hmm. And this was due to their uh, to their great stature and their ability to defeat in battle anybody that came against them. Right. So they're quite the dominant force. Sounds like. Yeah, very yeah. dumb. So what exactly happened to the giants? And, and also, Jason, please please chime in anytime you feel guided to do so. Uh, what happened to them? Did they go extinct? Did, was there a great war or battle? What, what exactly transpired? Well, the, uh, the native record does tell us a good deal about the fate of the gigantic physical types. And according to the tradition which was taught to the white man by the Delaware, their ancestors, the Lenny Lenape, had encountered the giants when they crossed the Mississippi River at some point deep in the past. And after they crossed the river, a great conflict ensued. And there are numerous interpretations of what happened during this war and following its outcome And one of the most interesting is the interpretation that Ross has, because it also incorporates the origin of the Adena physical type. Ross, if you'd like to tell us something about that. Yeah, there was a a story that was collected by an early Christian minister uh, from actually from Europe. Uh, It was um, a group of... um, of, uh, of, of Christian, uh, very strict uh, culture, who uh, set up a, a temporary station in uh, New Philadelphia, Ohio, and they began to baptize the Lenny Lenape, who uh, at that time called themselves the Delaware. But it was from the stories that Heckewelder, John Heckewelder, picked up from the Lenape uh, that uh, we were able to glean the first evidences of a race of giants in the native record. Of course, native people didn't write things down, at least as far as we know, because uh, everything that they had was destroyed uh, when the white people first started um, coming into the Ohio Valley. And uh, so the the story goes like this. The uh, Lenny Lenape... Uh, a, a long time ago, perhaps as long ago as 2,500 years, but more than likely about 2,200 years ago. Excuse me, about about 3,200 years ago, um, began to move from the uh, from some extreme point where the United States is now, out west, to uh, to the eastward. And when they got to the Mississippi River. And there were probably quite a few of them, with their with their animals and their and their women folk and their men and their children. Um, they uh, they sent scouts across the uh, the Mississippi, which was uh, a bastardized term from the Nemasi Sipu, which is the river of many fish. Sipu means river, and Nemasa means fish. So um, when the scouts came back, they had a, quite a story to tell that living in, in parts of Illinois and Arkansas, uh, there were um, these towns, these townhouses that were um, protected by these uh, upright trees that were, that were uh, spaced in such a way that they protected the people within and created what we would call a gated community. And uh, 
the people would sally out, and the uh, scouts for the Lenape were were noticing them, observing them, unknown. And they noticed that some of the men were extremely tall and powerful, and that the tallest of the Lenape men only got up to the shoulders of the tall women among these people. And uh, they discerned that they called themselves the Allegheny, the Allegheny. And they took this information back across the river. And about the same time, another group called the Minkwa, which is really just a word for friend, they could have been Sioux-related. And uh, they called themselves the Minkwa or the Mengwe. And uh, they met with the Lenape on the opposite shore of the uh, of the Namasi Sipu from the Allegheny, and they were they were friends. So um, they began to um, kind of explore the possibilities of crossing the river as friends. So they sent a message to the Allegheny people, probably in Illinois asking if they could live among them and learn from them because they sensed that this was the promised land. But as Jason and I have discerned, um, they had already a group of people living among them that served likely as a servant class or a, an audience to their, to their stories and to their bidding. And so they were, the Lenape and Lenape were refused admittance into their society. So the Lenape asked if they could pass through their land. Well, there was a limit to their territory, and it went on to the Allegheny Mountains in Pennsylvania. But first they'd have to cross over Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and get to this promised land. Uh, in Pennsylvania. So the Allegheny said, it's okay with us, but they didn't know, you know, what the next person was going to say, I'm sure, because if they had such a powerfully exclusive community, you know, barricaded, I'm sure that it was because they were engaged in strife with their fellows and other communities going east. Mm -hmm. So, um, they began to cross. And you can imagine their horror when the Allegheny came down on them uh, and killed as many as they could, leading the rest of them to scurry back across uh, because they were just annihilated. And they said, what would cause them to do this? They gave us permission to cross. Why weren't they letting us, you know, go through their lands? And it was because we've discerned that uh, the Allegheny people thought that the Lenny Lenape and the Mingue were being deceitful in uh, not telling them how many people they had. But um, this was a matter that should have been taken up. So the Lenape um, kind of sat there on the, on the opposite shore on the western shore of the Mississippi, and they made a decision. Many of them went back to where they came, perhaps to Mexico or perhaps up in, um, you know, the great northwest, making a decision if they should just go home, set up a permanent camp there, or should they cross over and make war with these people and show them that they were not cowards. And uh, I'll let Jason finish that story. Well, the way that the story continues is that upon re-entering the territories of the Allegheny, a fierce war ensues, and the Lenape, and we don't know how long this war persisted. Some people believe it persisted for generations. I've seen some people comment and say that it may have only been a few weeks or a few years. But whatever the length of the war, the Lenape were ultimately successful, and they overcame the Allegheny, 
who had giants among them. And what I find to be very intriguing about Ross's interpretation of this history is that if the Lenape were crossing the Mississippi at around 1000 B.C. or earlier, 1200 B.C., and there were already giants on this side of the river, if these Allegheny were already firmly entrenched in the valley at such an early time period, then there should be an archaeological record of a deeper age for the cultures that we associate with the giants than is publicly available. And that's a big part of the research that we've been doing uh, from our end of this, is we've been investigating the true age of the cultures who had gigantic elites among them. And it's been very interesting, because according to mainstream archaeology, the earliest dates for an Adena culture-like manifestation are around 300 or 400 B.C. But here in the Canal Valley in Charleston, recently, early Adena pottery of the Phaethic variety has been dated in context to 1375 B.C. Also, Adena half-moon cord-marked pottery has been dated to 1290 B.C. We have also undertaken an investigation of the manuscript that was written down by the agent of the Smithsonian who excavated the Adena Mounds in Charleston, West Virginia, in 1883 and 1884. And in the manuscript, there's mention of one mound in particular. It's known as the Catacombs Mound. And the agent of the Smithsonian claims that in the body of the mound, no artifacts were found, but artifacts were found in subsurface tombs which were deep beneath the mound. Looking at the archaeological record, the artifacts that have been recorded from this mound are archaic. They are archaic points and fragments of archaic banner stones. So this evidence suggests that in accordance with the native record, there is archaeological evidence for a pre-Adena, Adena-like culture, which is old enough in age to represent these Allegheny encountered by the Lenape. That's great work, Jason. I was going to ask you, what, uh, what kind of artifacts uh, were discovered? The artifacts discovered beneath the Catacombs Mound in Charleston were reviewed by Edward McMichael, who was the state archaeologist in West Virginia in the 1960s. And in his documentation, he notes that these are lanceolate archaic points, stemmed archaic points, and fragments of an archaic banner stone. Now, all of these types of artifacts can be traced back as far as 4000 B.C., and none of these artifacts are supposedly a part of the Adena taxonomy, even though they're found deep under the surface of an Adena mound. This would also imply that the Adena mounds in Charleston were built successively over a much older site. And that really wouldn't surprise us because there were over 50 Adena mounds in Charleston. There were between 8 and 10 ceremonial enclosures, and there were as many as 64 stone mounds and stone walls surrounding the valley when it was excavated by the Smithsonian. So it's entirely possible that many sites in Ohio and West Virginia are Allegheny sites. By Allegheny, we mean the term that was used for the proto Adena people encountered by the ancestors of these Delaware. And this very ancient record of pottery and artifacts persists in Ohio and Kentucky in Adena sites there. For example, there are many Adena mounds in Ohio that have been dated to well before 400 B.C. 
the Melvin Phillips Mound was dated to between 2500 and 2200 B.C. The Munson Springs Mound produced a date of 1122 B.C. A group of subsurface archaic burials under the William H. Davis Mound were dated to 1405 B.C. And some classic Adena Mounds, like the Tefker Mound, yielded radiocarbon dates of 1200 to 800 B.C., the Klein Mound was dated to 822 B.C., and pottery in Ohio has recently been dated at the Bremen site to as early as 2,472 B.C. And this pottery, like that from West Virginia, is the very thick, Fayette thick type of early Adena pottery. So there is clear evidence that this culture or a culture from which it descended is much older than what we get from the mainstream sources. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's incredible work, Jason. I applaud both of you for all of your investigation, research, and information. It's uh, very impressive beyond words. And, and of course, we, we all know about the obfuscation that happens with uh, Smithsonian and things like that. Do you all want to comment at all? Yeah, yeah I'll start out. This. Um, <clears throat> first of all... Um, I don't think we've made it very clear, but the Adena, um, the archaeological Adena, a name we made up, uh, were the Lenape. Um, but our archaeology didn't know that until uh, the late 40s, into the 50s, uh, when um, some, uh, some tracing was made of uh, Adena people having left uh, during the middle Adena period, Ohio, and gone into places in upstate New York and so forth, the Canadian Maritimes. And so uh, they were able to trace the movements of Adena people through their relics and artifacts. Um, but to our knowledge, there are no uh, bones of very tall Adena, uh, although um, this is uh, archaeological knowledge out of the, uh, out of the settler record out of the records of the people who moved in uh, post-Revolutionary War to upstate New York and Pennsylvania and so forth, um, we uh, find the records of many skeletons uh, that exceeded, considerably exceeded, in some cases, seven feet. And uh, we've been able to match up uh, uh, a lot of uh, Native stories, especially from Heckewelder, um, and the archaeological record in that vein also. So it's been just a, a wonderful uh, bringing together of archaeology and the folk tradition, uh, which is absolutely necessary to clear the, uh, to clear the shadows out of this subject. Um, uh, as far as the Smithsonian is concerned, um, we have to be aware that the Smithsonian had a virtual monopoly on museum uh, entities uh, from the time it was first conceived uh, uh, to the present day, actually. Um, but there was a relaxing of that monopoly uh, in, in just at the beginning of the professional period of archaeology, which was earlier in the last century. 1920s, 1930s began uh, the professional or, um, or the, uh, the actual beginning of, uh, of formal archaeology, and they call it the, f the formal period. Um, so when the Smithsonian uh, noticed by the 1880s, now the Smithsonian was founded in about 1848, uh, on, a, on a meager grant, which was a lot to them, but it was probably a little less than a million dollars today. Um, what, what, they, uh, what they noticed uh, from their federal point of view uh, in Washington was that the mounds and the earthworks through, throughout the eastern United States, and we estimate there's at least 50,000 of them, many of which were burial mounds, probably most of which were burial mounds. The others were ceremonial-type mounds. Um, were, were being demolished by the local population uh, to sell 
the uh, artifacts of the last Stone Age culture known to exist. Of course, we didn't know about South America at that time. It was still mm -hmm. new. Uh, and so the people were, um, were just rummaging and just tearing these mounds apart with no regard for native sanctuary. And can you imagine if, uh, if, uh, if the Chinese came in here and conquered us real quickly and just started digging up all of our graveyards and destroying our monuments? Mm -hmm. What would you do? You know, you'd be really upset, especially if, if the native, especially because the natives believed that uh, these mounds were ingresses to the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And that even when, when they had wars between themselves, both sides respected the earthworks. And the mounds, they didn't tread on them, and they, they for sure never dug them up. They would add um, themselves to these ancient works because they believed them to be sanctuaries and ingresses, like I said, to the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And and so um, the uh, the people were digging into them, and the Smithsonian, noticing this, said, "Ah, we're missing out." So they began to, of course, there was no archaeology being taught in the colleges at that time. There was no formal degree that you could get in archaeology or ethnology, really, uh, or anthropology. So um, much of the work that the Smithsonian were training men for uh, uh, was housed by men who had, uh, who had lawyer uh, credentials or uh, MD credentials, or just men who were antiquarians, which is kind of a society in those days. And uh, the antiquarians were looking for evidence of, uh, you know, biblical uh, or pre-biblical uh, value. And, uh, you know, these are the anti-flood people or, or the post-flood uh, interested people. Even uh, int people interested in remnants of Atlantis were antiquarians. So um, they had an extremely open mind, which we now know about, that we've been able to uncover more and more about the past in the present day. But um, uh, that, of course, was, uh, was broken up also as archaeology began to distinguish itself as a scientific endeavor, which means that you don't listen to Native stories anymore. You just... You do everything by science. And so the Smithsonian trained scientifically these men in the local populations to go out and dig up the mounds and see what they could find and ship everything back of value to the Smithsonian. And what they found was the same as what the people have been finding and publishing in the local newspapers and in their diaries skeletons of men and women that were exceeding seven and a half feet and eight feet in many cases, but, but having a benchmark of seven feet. There weren't that many uh, people that were in the range between six and seven feet. There were some, but it seemed to start at seven feet, and there were hundreds of them, perhaps thousands. And uh, they were all over the eastern United States. But it, it seemed that they originate out of Ohio from, from all the accounts that we've been able to, to put together and, and made a map out of it. Cecilia Hall did that. And uh, they, they, it forms the image of like a, a great United States eagle when you look at it with Michigan as the head of the eagle when you put all these accounts together and mark them on the map. It's really kind of interesting when you look at it. Because it seems to harken back to an ancient country, a country that um, may have called itself uh, uh, Manitoba, and was inhabited by the Alihana people or the or the Aligana people. But we think now that the the Allegheny were a, a, the last sect of this former Alihana society that was all over the eastern United States but they uh, named themselves after the river that they uh, set up, and that was the uh, Allegheny River, which is now called the Ohio. 
and how it fed into the Mississippi. So it, it was once uh, the the Allegheny River all the way from from uh, Pennsylvania to uh, to Missouri and Illinois in that area, and then perhaps it was uh, called the Nemasi Sipu. So gathering all these relics from the Allegheny Territory, especially, and then going up into New England, into the Dakotas, and down into the Great South, they unearthed just so many of these uh, giant skeletons uh, that um, they were uh, pretty much inclined to stop reporting on them by the late 1880s. And uh, we, we read accounts that uh, admitted that they found giant skeletons, but they said, but you maybe should be very careful about reporting back on them. But many of these accounts were already published in the earlier reports. And so a man uh, was still credible reporting on giants back in the early 1880s and the middle 1880s. But by the 1890s, it seemed like uh, we better not talk about them because we're getting a lot of flack from scientifically minded people. Oh, that's a shame. Correct. Go ahead. So you, you want to add something to that, Jason? I, I would love to. You're referring to the time period after the policy of denial began when scientific credentials would be questioned of people who accurately reported the sizes of some of these skeletons. And that actually... Um, that actually comes back to an investigation we've done locally here in West Virginia. In the 1930s, there were a group of mounds opened in Doddridge County here in West Virginia, and the excavator of these mounds, Ernest Sutton, did a series of interviews with local newspapers in the in June of 1930, in which he explained that this mound group yielded skeletons that were seven and a half to nine feet tall. Well, we recently did a private investigation in the region where these skeletons were found, supposedly found. We interviewed probably 20 to 30 different people. These were all prominent people. And then after that, we began to simply interview locals. We went to the, the county courthouse, interviewed everyone who worked there. We used old land records to find the location of the mounds. And eventually, we made contact with several sources who wish to remain anonymous. And one of the pieces of information that was given to us was a piece of correspondence between this excavator, Ernest Sutton, and the Ohio Historical Society, that's dated to 1966, in which the Ohio Historical Society was questioning his methods for measuring skeletons found in these mounds in West Virginia. Now, in this piece of correspondence, Ernest Sutton replied that he was using the femur to account for one-third of height for the skeletons that were excavated here in West Virginia. And according to some of the people I've spoken with on using the femur to determine height, this individual was actually underestimating the height of these skeletons. So there's certainly a record for a type of uh, an attempt to stifle people from publishing the accurate measurements of many of the skeletons that have been found in these mounds with heights that reached and in some cases exceeded seven feet. Mm -hmm. And what happened to the skeletons that uh, the Smithsonian acquired? Well, well you I'll let Ross that. start with that. And Ross, well, could you do me a favor and speak up, please? Uh, everybody's having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, how's that? Uh, Much better, it? yeah, if you could do that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, um, about 19, very, very early uh, uh, 20th century, uh, there was a, a, a character 
uh, was named to the Office of, uh, of Anthropology at the Smithsonian named Aless Herlichka. Herlichka was an MD specializing in physical anthropology who uh, was brought on board of the Smithsonian uh, to bring uh, cutting-edge science and uh, a strong personality. And uh, this guy was a, was a real piece of work. Um, it, the, the stories of, of his discouraging young archaeologists and anthropologists just because uh, they didn't want to agree with what he believed was the truth, uh, and I put that in quotation marks, are, uh, are many in number. Uh, um, he apparently um, called together a number of newspapers uh, in Washington and through New York and uh, reached out to the entire country saying that there never were any giants in headlines and that all of the skeletal material that was sent to the Smithsonian were falsely identified in the field as, uh, as giants. And, and uh, they, 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 uh, they, no longer, uh, they no longer should be uh, uh, considered to have been a viable uh, 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 source of, uh, of facts uh, when these people were, uh, uh, the people who were reporting on them. Now, you have to remember that there were hundreds of such reports. So that leads one to believe that everybody was engaged in some sort of a conspiracy uh, over uh, a hundred year period, or maybe more like an 80 year period, to conceal evidence or, or to report on evidence, uh, whichever way you want to go, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the giants having existed. So uh, there appears to be a long period where everybody believed they existed and were reporting on them from first-hand digs, and then suddenly nobody believes in them, and they absolutely don't exist. So, you know, uh, are we supposed to look back at, at, our, at our ancestors, our great-grandfathers, and say, well, because you didn't have the kind of technology we have, you must have been mistaken just like, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks and Romans are, were totally inferior to us today uh, because uh, we're just much smarter than they are, not thinking that we built on what they produced. So, it, you know, it's a matter of language and it's a matter of personal uh, belief. But we do know that Native Americans were trying to get their rights back every piece of land was taken from them and they were beginning to use the court system to no avail to try to get their lands back, especially with the Cherokee. They were bold enough to attempt it. And then the Iroquois. And, and, but uh, there was just a, uh, a remarkable amount of racial prejudice uh, kind of embodied in this guy, Aless Herdlitschka, because he was a member, an outstanding member of the Eugenic Society. It's like being it's like being the president of the Jim Crow Club, you know, down south. Uh, and and you know what Jim Crow did to black people down south. It just continued with the policies of, of the pre Civil War era. And uh, blacks were mutilated and tortured and beaten, denied their civil rights constantly by Jim Crow. And Aless Herdliska was doing the same thing with Native Americans, saying that you, the white race should not intermingle with these inferior races. And he, he specifically spoke of the black race. But he went ahead and he did uh, so, so-called scientific studies on the Lenny and Lenape because they were the ones that supposedly had originated the, the very tall stature for their genetics. And he... he uh, rewrote the history of the Lenny Lenape saying that they were just average intelligence and average height and left it at that. And then he went up to Alaska and, uh, and destroyed, by looking through the Aleutian Caves, destroyed all the evidence of giants that he could find. And he wrote another piece, another masterpiece of, of spin that, uh, that discussed... Uh, um, all of the all of the happen 
happenstance of his uh, exploring these caves, and nobody could refute him. After all, he was a lesser you know, He was the head of, of the Smithsonian Anthropology Department. And uh, he even tried to uh, snuff out uh, uh, Louis Leakey when Leakey was still just a, uh, a student. He said to Leakey, he stormed into his rooms in England one day. He, he left the United States and went to England and, uh, and said to Leakey, what's this I hear about your, um, your claiming that these uh, civilizations in California are, are, uh, are as old as you say? I think he was saying they were uh, 9,000 years old or something like that. And he said, he said that's impossible. He said, what proof do you have? And Leakey explained to him, well, you know, with so many different cities being uh, established and so many different language uh, dialects being, being known, we know from history that that would take many thousands of years to establish. And Erlitsky had just said, rubbish! And, you know, and he tried to, uh, tried to intimidate him into stopping. And then there were other archaeologists of the time that said, if you ever find anything that's in context that has to do with giants or having anything to do with native people having an extraordinary civilization or intelligence, hide it carefully, but don't, don't lose track of where it is, you know, because one day her Lisco will be out of office. <laughs> and so that's the way it went. Mm-hmm. And uh, Herdlitska was like a negative bomb that went off and just destroyed everything. And those bones you're asking about, my mm-hmm. Solaris, mm-hmm. those bones, we think, were crushed and dumped into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so many of them are, are missing. That's terrible. I've got a little bit to add to that. Yeah. Um our research has revealed that Herlichka was not alone in being associated with the Smithsonian and the American Eugenics Society. Uh, in fact, at the time period, the entire architecture of the Smithsonian was teeming with high-profile members of the American Eugenics Society and the elite class. A great example is... The fourth secretary, Charles Doolittle Walcott, who was a close friend of Herlishka, Walcott was an outspoken proponent of eugenics, and he had originally worked under the finance of J.P. Morgan at the New York State Museum. And Walcott is the individual who enshrined the the teachings of Herlishka in the university circuit. And the, the third secretary of the Smithsonian, Samuel P. Langley, had worked directly for Andrew Carnegie before going to the Smithsonian. In fact, Langley was for a time the director of Carnegie's Allegheny Observatory. Langley was hand-chosen by Carnegie to be on the board of directors of the Carnegie Institute of Science in 1902, which was the heart and soul of the American eugenics movement and the home to the eugenics records office. The second secretary of the Smithsonian, Spencer Fullerton Baird, was also the secretary of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And this organization was an early bastion for the doctrines of scientific racism later espoused by the eugenicists and the association of the American Association for the Advancement of Science with the Eugenics Research Association, was essential to the success of eugenics in American government policy. It can be demonstrated that the hierarchy of the Smithsonian, at the time when the gigantic skeletons were concealed, was essentially a revolving door of individuals who worked for eugenics interests. Absolutely astonishing. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) <laughs> Certainly. Is. Yeah. Well said, both of you. Like I said before, I'm very impressed with this information and uh, so disturbing on so many different levels. What a disservice to so many people who would like to explore the truth and the, and the lineage behind all of this, you know. Well, the Smithsonian yeah. works, uh, the, the Smithsonian with people like Herlitschka and the other individuals we've mentioned, it operated very similar to the EPA, the FDA, 
the USDA or any other regulatory agency of the U.S. government except the commodity which they were regulating was our understanding of prehistory and the greater ancestors. It represents a type of occupation similar to the way that you would occupy a people's economic or political system, except this occupation is designed to redefine prehistory. And as far as the gigantic skeletons, we have attained several manuscripts from the Smithsonian vault that were written by their field agents while in the field in the 1880s, excavating the skeletons. And a couple of things emerged from the study of these manuscripts that we feel are very important. One of those things is that these skeletons were not disarticulated. For example, Herdlitschka and people like Herdlitschka today routinely explain these these gigantic skeletons as saying, well, they were disarticulated in the tomb or the people didn't know how to measure. But an example that is directly contrary to this is from Charleston. The gigantic skeleton that was used for the recent reconstruction that we did with Marcia K. Morbrev and Adina Giant came from the Great Smith Mound in Charleston, West Virginia. And according to this manuscript, which represents the dated field diary of the Smithsonian agent that opened this mound, in his own handwriting, this skeleton was completely wrapped in bark and encased in clay when it was buried. That skeleton was not disarticulated by the weight of the earth, and neither were his bones scattered in the tomb. This skeleton was measured in situ the same way that we would measure a skeleton today. And the height of the skeleton was seven foot six. And the excavating agent was even able to measure the distance between the shoulder blades. So well articulated was this burial. Fascinating. That's incredible. And do you see a correlation between these, these giants and uh, Nephilim? That, that's something Jason will handle. Well, um, we consider our job to be to document what is essentially raw data. Everything that Ross is talking about, everything that I'm talking about, this is raw data. And archaeological data is open to interpretation by the individual who studies it. At this point, it's my belief, that this is a belief that I share with my wife, that these beings and their predecessors, who were much larger, these beings and their predecessors represent the historical reality of the beings that we find referenced in oral traditions and scriptures and mythologies from around the world. Because many of the gigantic skeletons, we're talking about skeletons between seven and eight foot tall so far tonight, but there is another collection of accounts of skeletons that are even larger. Now, these skeletons occur at a lesser frequency, but you can find them if you closely study the newspaper accounts and local histories that have become so popular over the last few years, and they are documented as ranging between 9 and 11 feet tall. And what we've managed to do in our studies is to take a review of about 5,000 years of archaeology and apply it to these newspaper accounts and local histories, and we've managed to discern the cultural affiliations of many of the larger skeletons based on the artifacts and the tombs that they're recorded as being found in, and we feel confident that a number of the larger skeletons actually can be dated to a much earlier period than the seven and eight foot tall Adina. So if that's the case, we may be literally looking at a situation where these gigantic beings gradually bred down and grew smaller as time passed. 
Yeah. Okay, and, and Jason, I wanted to, um, we're going to head for a break real quick. We'll be right back. Please stay tuned. We're at the Dark Matter Digital Network. This is Hyperspace. My special guests are Jason Gerald and Ross Hamilton. back everybody here at the Dark Matter Digital Network. I'm Solaris Blur and you're listening to Hyperspace and I'm here with my very special guests Jason Gerald and Ross Hamilton. Gentlemen, are you with me? Yes, yes. All right. Here. Excellent. And Jason, you want to you want to wrap up with what you were saying before we hit the break? Well, I was just I was just covering the fact that uh, Sarah, my wife and I have spent the last 3 years studying archaeological cultures in North America going back to about 5,000 B.C. And in studying these cultures, we've studied the burial ritual spanning this immense period of time. And many of the accounts of the very large giants that you'll see reprinted in any number of books on giants today the very large giants, the tombs they're often documented as being found in are subsurface graves. Very rarely are the enormous giants found in mounds. And in a study that we did comparing what few artifacts and burial traits we could glean from those accounts from the 19th century and early 20th century, we've decided, we've determined that these larger giants, these greater ancestors, are in fact from earlier cultural manifestations, and perhaps you can actually trace the line of descent of these beings down through time to the seven and eight foot Adena elites. Yeah. Uh, Jason, you know, when we started the program, I said, Jason and I don't agree on everything, but you know what? I'm going to reverse my opinion. <laughs> I want to admit that uh, that uh, I was wrong because the way you articulated, <laughs> excuse the pun, uh, your your view of what uh, Solaris called the Nephilim, um, I, I do agree with that. I do agree with that. I think it's possible that the term Nephilim has been a little overused in connection with the, with the tall 
people. But uh, the individual that's doing that, that's, that's what he does. So, you know, um, uh, I, I think we should just accept it for what it's worth. The reason I'm saying that is because Native American people, um, and I researched this, uh, oddly enough, from uh, James Mooney, who, who wrote uh, for the uh, Smithsonian back in the late 1800s. He was collecting stories from the Cherokee tradition. And there is a, uh, a connection between, I believe, the Nephilim and the Nunahim uh, in, um, in the United States. The Cherokee believe in the Nunahim or the, uh, the Nahuo, whereas in the East they believe in the, in the Nephilim. And uh, <clears throat> this, of course, has been overlooked um, uh, by um, people here in the United States um, because uh, Native American spirituality hasn't really been considered uh, uh, something that is worthwhile delving into, unless you just take the best parts, you know, the great spirit, that part, you know, the one, the one we both agree on one God and all that. But in reality, Native American people have in their myths and their stories a whole treasure house, very similar to what the Greeks have in Theostan and us, starting with the Romans, um, they passed it down to, and uh, it describes a race of people who yet live in the territory that we call the United States, the Eastern United States, um, that they call um, Turtle Island, and uh, it's it's not exactly in our ability to perceive with our eyes. It's more like a mystical afterlife realm. It's a subtle realm. The Greeks termed it the Elysian Fields, and well, virtually every culture has a has a name for um, you know this this paradisiacal places where people go when they pass on. But certain chosen people can actually enter into these places while they still live in the flesh. Still, simply by purifying the flesh and becoming um, obedient to the instructions of the people that live in these uh, paradises that are all over the earth, according to legend. So we have this, uh, this wonderful uh, collection of stories that was put out by Mooney, and it tells about how um, when a certain tribe... I believe it was a, a, a certain faction of, of the uh, of the Cherokee were having to deal with a, a very hostile tribe that came from deep in the south, perhaps uh, from another country, perhaps from Mexico, and uh, they were just murdering everybody uh, along along their path. And uh, these people were, they lived up in probably Tennessee or perhaps in Georgia or noticing this, and there was nothing they could do about it short of leaving their homes. So they just prepared themselves for the onslaught of uh, of this killer tribe, and then suddenly, when they were just on them and beginning to pull out their hatchets, a, a, a group of other men came and walked between them, between the uh, the Cherokee and met this group and told them to stay away because uh, if they do they'll all be annihilated and um, they they wouldn't you know this invading group said no and so I guess they just pulverized them pulverized the first few of them and they did it so so professionally and so dem- demonstratively that. Um, it threw the fear of of God into this tribe, and uh, I guess they allowed a certain number of them to live, and uh, they left, and they never came back. So uh, then these people who helped the Cherokee said goodbye, and they were thanked, but then they disappeared into the side of a mound, if I remember correctly. And there is another story how they they uh, 
they were having trouble, and they 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 just came out of the side of of one of their great earthworks uh, through a door that they didn't know was there. And then when they left, they went back to the door, and then it wasn't there anymore. And these are Indians telling this story, so you know we know that Indians don't lie, especially when when the um, when the story involves uh, something that has to do with their religiosities. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, it was white men that brought lying and the art of uh, of lying into the United States, and that's why the red man, well, the, the native people, couldn't understand how the white man would break treaties and things like that. Uh, yeah. Because the you know the Indians never did that; they didn't lie. I mean, they they may lie uh, on an individual basis. It wasn't like they didn't have any liars, but it was just like a, a an isolated case. Did you kill this person? Uh, n- no, it wasn't me. Well, they'd find out, you know, by putting their finger in a bowl of water and see if they tremble. But generally speaking, if you were given the task of ruling a tribe or given the task of being the carrier of the ethos of the people through storytelling or through medicine, you had to have an impeccable uh, sort of uh, personality that, uh, that uh, never lied and always told the truth as far as they could remember it. So we know these stories uh, don't have a grain of truth, but we know they have a great deal of truth, too. Okay. There was this, another story of a child, and uh, this child was uh, kind of bored. He was out in the woods. He left his village. He was probably about 12 years old or so. And he was hunting with his bow and arrow, but he couldn't hit anything. So he set up a fish trap, like a little dam, and he started collecting the water so he could spear some fish. And then uh, suddenly he was he was met by, by a man who was just walking along the side. And he noticed what the child was doing. And he, I guess he uh, convinced the child that he should take a break and, and come with him. So the child said, well, I have to get back to my... He said, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll, get you, we'll get you back. And there's no, no harm. So the child followed him and they went up a long hill and uh, through, uh, you know, some gardens and so forth. And they ended up at a lodge that uh, was very accommodating. And while he was in the lodge playing with some of the kids there, I guess, um, he met what he thought was a gentleman from his own village. And uh, so he felt very much at home, and and uh, he um, spent the night there after eating the food that these people offered him. And the next morning he went out and uh, he was taken back by the same fellow uh, down down the hill and past these beautiful uh, fields of corn and I think peach trees and, uh, and you know orchards of peach trees and then uh, he uh, found his way back to the stream and then uh, he said goodbye but when he turned around to look everything was changed it wasn't there anymore he couldn't he couldn't go back. So then he went back to his village, and apparently he'd been gone longer <laughs> than he thought, because they were all desperately worried about him. And he told them the story, and they all said, "Oh, you were taken in by the Nunahi, and these are the people that that live anywhere. You know, we hear their singing, and we hear their their music making, but we can't pinpoint where they are." So, you know, yes, they have their own version of the new name, of the, of the Nephilim, these fallen angels, so to speak. But these are people that actively support the native people and, in fact, um, gave them permission to come over to their side because they knew that the white race was coming. And so they encouraged many people to come, and they would instruct them to go to a certain place and wait and fast and wait and fast. And then when the time came when they were approaching, you know, malnutrition and dying, for those that stayed and believed, they would take them in. And so, it, as the story goes, many of the people who didn't go through the rigor as proposed by the Nunahi to get over to the, to the paradisiacal lands regretted not doing so after they saw what the white people had done to them. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. When you talk about those mounds in the, um, you know, these giants coming out of these mounds, would it be a dimensional door or portal? I mean, what's, what's your impression of that? 
Yeah, there, there are stories uh, gotten from the Indian tradition as well as Irish tradition and Greek tradition that talk about, well, for example, Halloween. This, uh, this came from Ireland when um, people from the other world, you know, from people from the fairy world, would come out of the hills or out of the out of the mounds uh, that they constructed there. Some of them were burial mounds. Some of them were, you know, temple-like mounds. They would come out of the mounds, but first there would be a glowing of light that would come. Sometimes it was a red glow from within these earthworks, and then a, a dimensional door would open. And what we think happened, if you, if you know anything about uh, theosophical teachings, is that the people on the other side were able literally to increase the flow of the etheric and remove the etheric membrane that keeps in the goodness of the of the vital airs, making the paradise world far more uh, conducive toward longevity and growth uh, than this world. And when they open the door, this world will be temporarily flooded with the good air and and the and the, uh, and the sweetening condition of the of the etheric. So they will be able to perform functions that. Uh, that men in this world cannot perform. Uh, an average man, an average man that lives in the realm of the Nunahim is three times the strength of the strongest youth in this world. And the, the average height is something like twice that of a man in this world. Uh, because they continue to grow as they, as they continue to age. Mm-hmm. So um, the food they eat is different because the land produces a different type of more high-quality food that is, uh, that is digestible to a, to a fault of producing a chyle and, 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 and producing a blood uh, agent that, um, it, that produces a flesh and, and for the vital organs that enables them to hold uh, the internal light of the soul much better. And so as they grow older, they grow wiser and more in, in, in better control of their own thoughts and their minds. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Very much so. It's like, um, reminds me of mana or, um, you know, something to that event. Mana. Yeah. Yeah. Mana was produced by the plants. And of course the myth of mana is all over the world. Mm-hmm. Native, Native people had mana twos which were uh, spirits that they, they created, uh, they invoked after they would build their animal temples. Like the Serpent Mound is one of those great remnants of a Manitou that at one time was probably alive with life. Uh, but we've lost the art of invoking the, uh, you know, the power of the uh, etheric light into <laughs> those places. But the Cherokee say that at the head of the, of the great serpent, one time was a jewel that shone bright. And it was so bright that it would, it would draw you toward that place. And we now believe that those lamps were all over the world during the last golden age. And they were powered by the, uh, by the magnetic field of the earth by, by taking the magnetism, the magnetic flows, and concentrating them into powerful magnetic and, and uh, electrical fluxes that, uh, in combination with uh, with the ark, uh, with the ark uh, of the covenant, which they made many multiple versions of, uh, could produce these lamps that shone a limitless, brilliant light uh, that would dispel the darkness of the three-dimensional world into the world of five or even more dimensions. And that's why the mythologies of the ancient days talk about the titans and the gods that stood 12 to 15 feet in height and how the universe was more accessible because um, they could travel from planet to planet. We have this from Indian texts to travel in their vimanas or vihanas uh, in the twinkling of an eye because light, for example, 
uh, moves at a, at a sort of almost recognizable speed. No one really agrees on how fast light moves. Uh, but when there's an etherically enriched uh, air or atmosphere, light travels much faster. And so we see the light from uh, distant stars much sooner than we do now uh, if you're in the, uh, in the etheric world. And they say, they, we learn from the Indian masters, that if you're in the astral plane about that or in the causal world about that, there is almost no time elapsed from, um, from the stars and the planets releasing their light so everything is uh, just a beautiful universe of an infusion of light and music when you get up to the higher realms, heaven, as we would think of it. Mm-hmm. It's so, so beautiful. Yeah. You know, the, so the giants uh, represent that in my philosophy. They represent, as Jason said, the, the last remnants of a godly empire that um, is, I believe, destined to return to us by a cycle that is just now beginning to start, I believe in 2012, was the beginning of that uh, return of, uh, of the giants, return of the, of the gods, return of the new day, new day return of the Nephilim. And uh, I think we can look forward to it starting in the eastern United States, because my Indian sources say that the whole holy scene of India is moving to America. In other words, all the Indian masters, and there are thousands of them, who normally have been incarnating in India, have both late been sending their ambassadors, starting with Krishnamurti and Yogananda back in the 20s and 30s, uh, have been increasing the number of saints and masters, and now they're just incarnating as in Western bodies so that um, we're, we can look forward already, if you know how to, how to seek them out, but we can look forward uh, uh, over the next 20 years to seeing a lot of uh, enlightened uh, white men and Native American men and even Asian and black people, people that have the spirituality that normally was reserved for people in India having the Indian bodies. Mm-hmm. So they're coming here because they're, they're forming the nucleus for the next golden age. And um, I'll let Jason take that, because I think he has some thoughts on that. Well, uh, one of the subjects which you touched upon just now, Ross, was the traditions that have come down of some really extraordinary things recorded as happening among the earthworks. And that's very interesting to us because a part of our investigation of the Smithsonian turned up some interesting facts about J.W. Powell. And in 1879, J.W. Powell became director of the Bureau of Ethnology, And the Bureau of Ethnology was the branch of the Smithsonian, which oversaw the excavations of the North American burial mounds in the greater Mississippi Valley. Now, Powell is recorded in this role historically, but what is less known about Powell is that he was a published philosopher. And J.W. Powell was a Neo-Lamarckan Darwinian. Now, Neo-Lamarckan Darwinians believed that man could trigger his own evolution to a higher state. And J.W. Powell was one of the most prolific proponents of this philosophy during the time period. And really what it means is that Powell was a type of early transhumanist In 1878, a year before taking leadership of the Bureau of Ethnology, Powell formed a secret society called the Cosmos Club. The stated goal of the Cosmos Club was, quote, to promote its members in the advancement of science, literature, and art. 
And over the years, the membership of the Cosmos Club has included Woodrow Wilson, Alexander Graham Bell, Herbert Hoover, Theodore Roosevelt, Nelson Rockefeller, and even today, Henry Kissinger. Now, most of the people that have been involved with the Cosmos Club over the decades have been prominent politicians and inventors, especially inventors who learn to work and harness electromagnetic properties. One of the prominent members of the Cosmos Club was Vannevar Bush. Now, Vannevar Bush was the co-founder of Raytheon and the head of the Carnegie Institute of Washington in 1939. As chairman of the National Defense Research Committee, Bush headed up the application of advanced science to warfare. Of course, at this time, the Carnegie Institute was home of the American Eugenics Society's Eugenics Records Office. There's the American Eugenics Society again. Mm-hmm. Now, I find it very interesting that so many people who have been involved in the weaponization of Western society and the overburdening of the Western world with electromagnetic technology were also affiliated with this Cosmos Club that was founded by the individual who had the most authority at the time that the earthworks and the mounds were excavated in the Ohio River Valley. And some people, including Ross, I believe, believe that these earthworks may actually have been able to generate energy. Is that right, Ross? Yeah, we're still we're still piecing that together, but we have a a pretty good a pretty good bead on that fact. Yeah. I could explain a little bit when you get done. Yeah, please do whenever okay, you're ready. Thanks. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. You you all are so awesome. Just keep rolling. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I don't get called awesome very much. (laughs) Um, (laughs) (laughs) You're still spring chicken, sir. (laughs) That's right, Ross. (laughs) Well, I think that one of the most fascinating things about the tall ones that Ross and Vine Deloria did so much to rediscover and, and to remind us of is that following the policy of denial of the Smithsonian, they were actually rediscovered, measured, and photographed, and put on record by mainstream archaeologists. In fact, the premier scholar and field archaeologist who helped define the culture and the physical anthropology of Adena was William S. Webb. Webb worked with a physical anthropologist named Charles Snow, to reconstruct the skeletal features of the Adena people. Now, Webb and Snow had studied hundreds of Adena skulls and crania, and they concluded that the Adena people represented a very distinct physical type, genetically separate from other prehistoric people, including the Hopewell. As a physical type, as detailed by Webb and Snow, is that of a people with an extremely high cranial vault. Their index between 89 and 92 on average, with some reaching as high as 100, and this makes the Adena a brachycephalic or high vaulted race. The crania had prominent foreheads with very large brow ridges, very large cheekbones with forward and lateral prominence. The upper and lower jaws have been described as prognathous, powerful and very wide with a large bony chin. And at the Dover Mound in Kentucky, William S. Webb, in an upper tomb in the mound, encountered a seven-foot-long Adena skeleton. Now, the contribution of Webb and Snow corroborates the earlier accounts of the newspapers and the early historians who had written about seven-foot-long skeletons with very large skulls and and very large jawbones. Now, the next archaeologist to put the Adena physical type on record was Don Dragoo. And Dragoo 
was chief curator of the Department of Anthropology at the Carnegie Museum. In 1963, Dragoo published Mounds for the Dead, which was his magnum opus on the Adena culture, and which featured his detailed examination of the Cresap Mound in Marshall County, West Virginia. In 1958, when Dragoo excavated the Cresap Mound in a subsurface tomb, he encountered Burial 54, and this is a quotation from Dragoo's report of Burial 54 of the Cresap Mound. This individual was of large proportions. When measured in the tomb, his length was approximately 7.0 feet. All the long bones were heavy and possessed marked eminences for the attachment of muscles. Now, Dragu believed and wrote in Mounds for the Dead that the gigantic Adena, the very large Adena, were an elite group within the Adena society. And he also believed that there were many more of the very large skeletons which we would never know about because of the prevalence of cremation in different periods of the Adena culture. So, with Webb and Snow and Dragoo, the earlier accounts, which the Smithsonian denies validity to, were in fact corroborated. The physical type of Adena giant discovered and described by these people, mainstream archaeologists in the 20th century, was exactly the type of giant which had been recorded during the 1800s coming from North American burial mounds. Excellent information right there. Any comment, uh, Ross? No, no sign of acromegaly. You, you, people are familiar with Andre the Giant, you know, the Princess Bride, and he was a great wrestler too. He stood about seven and a half feet tall, maybe a little taller. But unfortunately, he had acromegaly, which is a, a disease that affects the pituitary gland, usually in youth, and uh, ca causes great spurts of growth. And sometimes the um, the hands and the feet are elongated a little bit. But generally, a person with acromegaly uh, doesn't live past the age of 35 or 40. And these people did not have that disease. So we're really looking at a completely different race. The Webb and Snow, I think, were uh, probably at one point, they were giddy about it, but they realized they had to be sober about it. So they tried to nail it down, but it, it was like it wanted to escape out. <laughs> it, was, it was something that was so profound that um, it, was, it was almost advisable to leave it alone <laughs> because uh, their reputations could suffer. So they, they put a lot of emphasis on their taxonomy. <clears throat> and they put a lot of emphasis on uh, the traits. And they thought that in this way, uh, they could get their message across, and they emphasized the general populace of the Adena groups. And uh, so when they talked about finding a giant skeleton, they did report on it, but they, they did it in such a way where it was sort of like, um, okay, we're going to be just, just passionate about this. We'll just report it the way it is. And so Webb and Snow and Dragoo... At this date, even though uh, Dragoo was active through the 1960s, they, they're no longer referenced. Well, I mean, they're just starting to be referenced again. But they, they weren't referenced for a long time. And if they were, they were referenced selectively so that people passed over the, uh, the really tall skeletal remains because they didn't have any use for it. Now, we were going to talk about the, uh, the mounds, and their, their possible use as energy resources. Mm -hmm. And you might ask, well, how is that possible? <clears throat> what are you talking about? Well, it's a, it's a lost science, and it's the kind of science that really requires no concreting over of the world in general and with, uh, with no telephone poles and, and wires and and, uh, and uh, no railroads, <clears throat> it has to be, uh, for, for you to really understand the system, it has to be an unblemished 
natural environment. But what the Adena did, at least what had been passed down to them from the Alihana people who were of their kinship because of the war and the you know, the Lenape had defeated the Allegheny, so they inbred with them. They, they had almost entirely killed each other off. And the Mengwe watched while this happened. So they they sort of surrendered to each other, um, and, and they inbred. And probably there was a lot of a lot of Allegheny women were spared, and so it was the matriarchal uh, potential. Uh, which carried all and many of the genes for the male uh, uh, and and the female, and so when they started to procreate with them, there was dominant, fixed Allegheny uh, physicality of uh, this gigantic physicality uh, was passed down, and they quickly multiplied. So this race was also given the stories from the Allegheny tradition. So you can imagine. We have a, a conquered race. Excuse me for a second. We have a, a, a conquered race that was so extraordinary <laughs> and, and by happenstance so fortunate that they actually gave birth to a new generation of people that continued with the traditions of the extinguished race. Uh, I don't know if the language was there, but probably, probably the Lenape tongue uh, was mixed in with the uh, Alleghuli tongue, or maybe they both were proto-Algonquin. That's another thing I'd like to know. But in any case, along with all the genetics and, and the and the protection and the uh, and the, the doling out of responsibility by the matriarchal factor the electing of individual males to be mouthpieces and guardians, uh, came the knowledge of how to construct a conical mound, the most famous of which is in Jason, Jason and his wife's country. Uh, I should, we should have mentioned Sarah's name more, more frequently because she does a lot of this research. <clears throat> and, and that is the Grave Creek Mound. Now, these mounds um, were actually spaced at intervals across the landscape. There was one right in downtown Cincinnati, I know that, and a gentleman from Indiana wrote me about one that his grandfather knew about uh, in the fields there that was gone now. Uh, we have one that's still surviving, although it's kind of puddled out, in Miamisburg, Ohio. But they were very tall. Some think they, they could have been approaching 90, even 100 feet in the beginning. And according to native uh, legend, at the top were placed um, trees which had uh, a copper caps on them. Hmm. So uh, these were cut trees, you know, logs, that were placed in the tops of mounds, and they were decorated with copper on top. So, obviously, it was something that could attract lightning. Right. Conductor, yeah. Yeah. So, they, they did this uh, with uh, the knowledge that this energy was more than just something to impress the children and the ladies with. This energy could be used to enhance your health. But how so? A lightning strike doesn't enhance your health, does it? Well, yes. as it turns out, yeah, it does. We, <laughs> we, we now know, and we've only discovered this over the last 25 or 30 years, that when lightning strikes, uh, it has to be uh, uh, drawn down from the sky by uh, what we call a female charge, a Mother Earth charge, which is made of the magnetic flux. You know, the magnetic field of the Earth that's just been rerouted because it's passing through the matter of the earth and, and become not really electrical, but sort of like in a state between magnetism and electricity. So it, it breaks free of the magnetic field and it forms these powerful rivers of energy that combine into, into streaking rivulets and they wash over the surface of the earth constantly. 
and are internal to the earth as well. And um, the native people would find uh, where these places surfaced because they were, again, unmolested because they didn't have all the garbage that we have today. And they could trace them over hill and dale and through water sources. And they, they noticed that the earth herself tended to um, seed certain types of trees and plants uh, and, and cause them to live longer where these magnetic flows were especially prominent. And so in the old days, before even the Indians can remember, their ancestors were fashioning the landscape to be in harmony with these wonderful and powerful flows of what they called spirit force. And uh, when they would locate a fountain of it coming to the surface, there they would build or, or create their grave sites. And so their ancestors would be assured of having a ready-made portal right to the other world. They were a lot smarter than we give them credit for <laughs> because it was very much uh, depicted in the, uh, in the movie Avatar when they, you know, those trees were that had the, you know, like the weeping willow, self-luminescent trees grew. And the people actually had an organ that grew out of their, out of their heads that they could lock into their animal friends or the trees with so they could commune with the spirit of the earth, a vast universe of its own. Mm-hmm. a beautiful, tranquil, melodious universe that illuminated their minds and gave them the kind of peace and and love and goodness and protection that we all need today that are missing. So, right. yeah, so, so they had this. So these mounds were holy places. And in the beginning, uh, they, uh, they would create a, a single burial in these mounds maybe a few royal burials. and uh, But the mound would go up and it would attract uh, from the sky these lightnings. And if the mound, if the electricity or the, the magnetic force that was constantly entering into the mound kind of was stronger than the clouds overhead with their electrical energy, then the electrical energy would get drawn out of the clouds before the clouds turned black and were embroiled and, and sent lightning down. In other words, they would milk the clouds of their natural electrical force before the lightning struck. And so we have in an ancient Lakota uh, saying that I'm going to be publishing soon, that in the old days, the giants came down to the earth in the form of these manitous. And in those days, the, the lightning didn't strike, but it, it came in silence. The electrical energy came in silence in many colored rain. And the people in those days were prosperous and they knew the goodwill of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the thunder spirits and the thunderbirds. But then when the gods left, and they, dang, they dug the ditches where the rivers ran, by the way. Uh, when they left, they went back up to the stars and resumed their form as the Thunderbirds. And then the lightning began to strike, and the people's misery began to come back. So they had this technology not that long ago, just six, 7,000 years ago, that allowed them to sort of, well, actually control the weather in such a way that it brought extremely fertilizing influence into the land. I mean, extremely. Because, let's face it, it's what you eat that makes you what you are. Mm -hmm. And if you have food that's literally luminous with goodness, because it's perfected all of the DNA, all the hidden DNA, and it's you know, hidden in its seeds, which, uh, you know, seeds don't do nowadays. They only, they only grow as much as they're able to sustain. 
Um, and in the human beings, the same way. If we eat foods that are endowed with perfect, perfect light and and lumen and, 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 and vibratory principle, then the vestigial aspects of our DNA come out and blossom, and, and we grow and grow, and we become more peaceful and uh, and more forgiving and and more apt to bring peace and share our bounty with others because we feel rich and you know we have nothing to worry about and in fact ironically that's what adina means those who lack nothing it's taken after the same root as eden from the ancient hebraic so the adina people oddly enough were named after a paradisiacal principle uh, those who require nothing it's beautiful. So what we're looking at, yeah, yeah. I guess that sort of explains, in a nutshell, what the mouse. Now, now, of course, after the war, the people would, uh, you know, there'd be some, it is said in Heckewalders, there'd be some wars where so many of the men were, were killed on both sides that the two sides were called a truce and they'd just pile up all the bodies. And I think Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, says the same things about the ancient Elvish Wars, that so many uh, of the goblins and the, and the men would die that they just pile them up in big piles, and they cover them over with, with dirt. Mm-hmm. And so when the Adina came, came back, we think that uh, they had these technology mounds that, by the way, had these beautiful moats at the base of them. And they would divert streams to fill the moats so that when the energy came down from the sky, it would travel down the mound and fill the water of the moats with this extremely charged energy. And people could bathe in them or drink the water and it would open their inner senses, their inner visions and uh, their inner sense. And they could probably, from a lifetime of drinking that water, maintain the, the taller physique and also see into the happy hunting grounds. This is just a theory that I have. I think it's a pretty sound theory, if you excuse the pun, but mm-hmm. when after the war, the people were beginning to shrink again and uh, the technology was kind of forgotten because of what war had done to the landscape. But they continue with the creation of mounds to honor the, the dead. And so Dragu states that the Adina were the first to create mounds honoring the dead because there was a, a culture honoring the dead making its first appearance among the Adina people. Now, we know the Adina were the Lenape, right? And we know the Lenape defeated the Alagui. So that sort of ties it all together in a mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. I could hear you talk forever, by the way. It's amazing. Uh, it's this incredible interview. I'm so grateful for both of you for joining me tonight. You know, we're getting ready to wrap this up in about 10 minutes, but let's keep going here. Uh, did you have any comment there, Jason? Well, actually, I have a question for Ross. <laughs> um, with, with the way that you so eloquently laid out the way that this organic technology, that's what Sarah refers to the earthworks. She refers to them as organic technology. The, the function of these works, do you believe that people who may have been seeking power in the 19th or 20th century, if they would have known that these earthworks had these types of abilities, do you think that this would have been a type of technology that someone may have wanted to learn how to harness for their own ends. Well, of course. The problem with, with the European race is that it considered to be anything Indian inferior. But if they happen to piece together what, say, you know, these tall mouths may have been, been doing, because Franklin was able to invent the lightning rod, we know that, if they were able to piece that together, they would have attempted to improve upon it instead of just building another mound. 
they would have thought, oh, we can do better than that, and they would have created some sort of machinery like Tesla uh, is purported to have done. Um, you know, so, so yes, the answer is yes, but it would have ultimately been inferior to what the Indians had. And also, right. I want to, oh, go ahead, go ahead. So it would have been a type of a reverse engineered but very um, inferior version of the prehistoric technology. Exactly. Yeah. It is hard for some people to adjust to that, that the way the Indians lived was more desirable. Well, yes, but it was the ancestors, the direct ancestors of the Indians. They could afford to live naturally, even be nudists if they wanted to, because they had everything. They could, I mean, they could even parlay the winter away when they were at their full height of understanding this technology. They could sustain summer environments as long as they lived. Is- well, the reason I ask is because the the people who, like Ailey Sardlitschka, and Walcott that we discussed earlier, the scientific racists, they had inherited their belief system. The the belief system of the American Eugenics Society had actually begun in Europe in the mid-1800s among a group of people called the Arianists. And these Arianists were always searching for the remnants of a lost race with supernatural powers. But one of the most prominent Arianists who had a huge influence on people such as Walcott and Madison Grant in the United States was Arthur de Gobineau. And in 1855, de Gobineau published a book in which he listed the great empires of prehistory which the, which these individuals believed had this superior lifestyle and superior physical type. And among those civilizations, he mentions the Alahani Mound Builders of North America. Now, the Gabinu was writing in 1855 when he used this name for the Mound Builders of North America. Mm-hmm. And at that at that time the majority of Americans had never even heard this name. So I think it's interesting. It sort of makes you wonder whether or not someone knew that there was a superior civilization in the prehistory of North America. Of course, we wouldn't agree today with the beliefs of people like de Gobineau of who these people were, but it does seem that there are indications that the types of individuals who were affiliated with Thales Herlichka may have known that there was an advanced civilization in North America's distant past. Well said. I hope you're writing all this down, Jason. <laughs> well, I have it recorded. This is the beauty of, of having Keith Rowland as a producer. And I want to thank you all. By the way, we're getting ready to wrap this up, gentlemen. It's been an incredible interview with both of you, Ross and Jason. And I do want to have you back at some point in the continuum. It's been incredible. Uh, what, what an honor it is to meet with you, Ross. You are um, so nice to listen to. The stories mm-hmm. you share with us uh, just puts me in another orbit. And I really appreciate you. And, and also um, how articulate you are, Jason, your, your research with your wife, Sarah. Incredible, incredible work. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight here at the Dark Matter Digital Network. Please stay tuned for Dr. J Radio Live coming up next on the Dark Matter Digital Network, of course. And let's see here. We have a few minutes, plus or minus. But I wanted to comment real quick. I um, wanted to mention you had appearances on the Road to Ruins documentary film shoot. You want to comment on that? Well, we well, both uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll let Ross talk about that first. Okay. Well, Road to Ruins isn't what it sounds like. Um, it, it's not a road, the road to ruins. It was originally uh, meant um, visiting the, the ruins of all the ancient temples and mound structures. And, and uh, But it sounds like, you know, we're going down the wrong road. We're going down the road to ruins. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, yeah, there's just two guys, and, and one of them is an expert at filming. The other one is an expert at uh, at uh, working with people, and 
they kind of uh, came in here and they recorded uh, my my colleague Jeff Wilson and I uh, here at my home, and then uh, immediately the next day, I think, uh, after exploring a couple of the earthworks in Ohio, they uh, went over to see Sarah and Jason. So, uh, Jason, you want to take it from there, maybe enlighten them on uh, the, the listeners on what they were doing? Yeah, we have about a minute left there, Jason. Go ahead and wrap it up. Well, well basically, we had a great time becoming uh, the Smithsonian's worst nightmare, uh, recording a lot of alternative history, and we took them on a tour of the mounds and prehistoric sites in Charleston and showed them where the giants were buried. So that was an amazing time. That sounds awesome. And if anybody wants to get in touch with either one of you, what's the best way to do that? Well, um, I have a Facebook site. Um, It's a picture of the Serpent Mound, Cinder Ross Hamilton, R-O-S-S Hamilton, uh, it's got a picture of the Serpent Mound in winter, covered with snow. And I'll, I'll accept anybody unless you're a, a prostitute. <laughs> every once in a while, you get a, you get a prostitute on there that wants to use your site to display her wares. But, uh, but yeah, Jason's got a Facebook site too. Yeah, I, I'm on Facebook, and my wife Sarah and I have a website called Allegheny Mounds. And we're continually updating that. Awesome. Well, once again, I, I want to thank you both for being on the show tonight. It's been an incredible interview. And, of course, we'll have you back here. We have about 20 seconds plus or minus. So I do want to thank everybody again here at the Dark Matter Digital Network for all the support for Hyperspace and all you listeners who have supported the show. I really appreciate that. And, of course, we'll be over live at PSN Radio on Thursday starting in January 20, 2016. I can't believe the new year's coming around the corner, guys. So anyways, I wish you all a wonderful, happy new year. Thank you again, Keith, for an incredible job as a producer and webmaster. Best of wishes and luck to everybody. And I want to say thank you to all the hosts out there who made this station happen. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great week. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Ross. Jason. Good night. Thank you.